And again, we're going to cover this more tomorrow uh, because Elliot Abrams, in addition to being a horrible ghoul in and of himself, is a is a door. He's one of these people you can use as a door to understand. I mean, crimes across the globe, U.S. backed crimes from Latin America to the Middle East. Uh, there's a whole world to lay to waste. I mean, he's not doesn't have the power and the clout, but there is a kind of Kissingerian element here of blood on his hands across the globe. And Elliot Abrams, and so we'll play the clip where, I mean, it's just exquisite, and Elon Omar is one of the best members of Congress we have, and solidarity, solidarity, uh, and his, you know, his pestilent whining was also quite enjoyable to watch. But let's take this as a door here to understand exactly who this guy is and what his background is. And also, by the way, going back to the stupid coup question of earlier, this is the point person on Venezuela. Trump, the reason he's testifying to Congress is because the Trump administration and Mike Pompeo want this guy whose background is in backing death squads, mass murder mafia states, covering up the mass rape and slaughter of people, including children as young as babies, uh, to be the point person on Venezuela. So again, let's be very clear. This isn't just a history lesson. This is a contemporary threat emanating from the people from the United States to the people of Venezuela. So let's start with this sound. This is Elliot Abrams back in the 1980s. I don't think I see this one on the sound sheet. No, the one where he's talking. Uh, with Alan Nair. This is him with Alan Nair. Uh, I, it's not on the sound sheet. So Alan Nair one. and uh, Elliot Abrams on with Charlie Rose in 1995. Talking about uh, Guatemala. Okay, let's, so we're going to talk about Guatemala and El Salvador. We're going to do two little history lessons here, but this is defending. And again, I want to just give this setup by saying the general in charge of Guatemala in the 1980s that uh, Elliot Abrams is justifying and who backed is in prison right now for 80 years for genocide. This is a matter of public record. This is not just laudable lefty reporting. This is Elliot Abrams in 1995. I think... You have to be. You have to apply uniform standards. President Bush one took, once talked about putting Saddam Hussein on trial for crimes against humanity, Nuremberg-style tribunal. I think that's a good idea. But if you're serious, you have to be even-handed. If we look at a case like this, I think we have to talk, start talking about putting Guatemalan and U.S. officials on trial. I think someone like Mr. Abrams would be a fit uh, a subject for such a Nuremberg-style <laughs> inquiry. But I agree with Mr. Abrams that Democrats would have to be in the dock with him. The Congress has been in on this. The Congress approved the sale of 16,000 M16s to Guatemala in 87 and 88. Uh, hold on one second. I avoid, Pause it. They voted they, more. I don't know who this guy is, but he's a hero. Alan Nairn. I, oh, okay. Okay, I actually do know that name, but I don't know him well. This is amazing. And watch, I mean, of course, Abrams, this is actually a preview of his sleazy response. I mean, I mean, look at him, to Ilan Omar. But also look at Charlie Rose being like, whoa, 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 don't get impolite here. Go, he go ahead. Abrams, the Democrats would have to be in the dock with him. The Congress has been in on this. The Congress approved the sale of 16,000 M16s to Guatemala in 87 and 88. Hold on one second. I did avoid because they voted more military aid than the Republicans asked for. Again, I invite you and Elliot Abrams back to discuss what he did. But right now. Thanks, Charlie. But I want to go ahead. Do you want to repeat the question of you want to be in the dock? It is ludicrous. It is ludicrous to respond to that kind of stupidity. This guy thinks we were on the wrong side in the Cold War. Maybe he personally was on the wrong side. Uh, I am one of the many millions of Americans. Right. Mr. Abrams, I don't we're on the wrong side in supporting the massacre of, of no. peasants and organizers. What I want to do is, to I want to ask the following question. Absolutely, and that's a crime. That's a crime, Mr. Abrams, for which people should be tried. You now, have to yes. right. We'll put all the American officials who won the Cold War I'm in you. the dock. All right. Okay, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not mad at that. Let's play this clip from the BBC. This is 2013, and this is the general. Uh, of course, Elliot Abrams should be sitting right alongside him and Ronald Reagan and all these other uh, goons, uh, but he did actually face consequences. This is a BBC report. After 36 years of civil war in which 200,000 people were killed, few thought this moment would come. The former military leader of Guatemala, Efrain Rios Montt, in court to hear his sentence on charges of genocide and crimes against humanity. 
In court, too, some of the thousands of victims, members of the Ichchil ethnic group, who day after day had testified over the rape, torture and murder the military had inflicted on them and their families during Riosmont's time in power. I know this doesn't erase the pain, but it guarantees that the atrocities committed by the Guatemalan army won't be repeated. My brother can finally rest in peace and that thug will finally go to prison. And that means a lot in this country where there's so much impunity. In the, and now I'm going to quote from a piece from 2013 by Greg Graydon. Guatemalan slaughter was part of Reagan's hard line. In 1966, the U.S. Army's Handbook of Counterinsurgency Guidelines uh, summarized the results of a war game waged in a fictitious country unmistakably modeled on Guatemala. The rules allowed players to use, quote-unquote, selective terror, but prohibited, quote-unquote, mass terror, genocide. The guidelines stipulated was not an alternative. A decade and a half later, genocide indeed was an option in Guatemala, supported materially and morally by Ronald Reagan's White House. Reagan famously took a hard line in Central America, coming under strong criticism for supporting the Contras in Nicaragua and financing the counterinsurgency in El Salvador. His administration's in Guata actions in Guatemala are less well known, but even before the 1980 election, two re retired generals who played prominent roles in Reagan's campaign reportedly traveled to Central America and told Guatemalan officials that, quote, Mr. Reagan recognizes that a good deal of dirty work has to be done. Once in office, Reagan continued to supply munitions and training to the Guatemalan army, despite a ban on military aid imposed by the Carter administration. That led, and, and just briefly once more, uh, and Reagan was consistent in his moral backing for Guatemala's genocide heirs. In December 5th, 1982, for instance, he met with Rios Montt, the man we just saw in that clip, who was in prison for 30 years for genocide in Honduras, and said, quote, he was a man of great integrity and dedicated to democracy. El Salvador, and of course, Elliot Abrams is the point person for this. In El Salvador, this is a contemporaneous report, I believe it was Peter Jennings, actually, of some of these uh, uh, death squads backed in El Salvador. These are the types of people that Elliot Abrams was working with with Ronald Reagan. El Salvador right wing and the presidential candidate of ARENA, a slick, well-financed organization that is more than a political party. It's a paramilitary operation. When Dobison accepted the presidential nomination, he denounced death squads and violence, and he warned the United States not to make any threats against the El Salvador army. But this week, the Los Angeles Times and the Albuquerque Journal reported that one wing of ARENA is made up of death squads. The death squads strike at anyone they suspect of working for the guerrillas or sympathizing with them, even when friends are involved. Say, say I'm a businessman. I sit down and I have decided, along with my other friends, that you're a communist and you must die. I could pay one of my bodyguards to have you killed. That's one type of operation. Even if we're social friends, that happens. There was one man who very painfully told us that he had to sacrifice a friend of his in the name of free enterprise. So that's what we're talking about here. And now I'm going to quote from John Schwartz in The Intercept. In December 11th, 1981, in El Salvador, a Salvadoran military unit created and trained by the U.S. Army began slaughtering everyone they could find in a remote village called El Mozante. Before murdering the women and girls, the soldiers raped them repeatedly, including some as young as 10 years old. They joked that their favorites were the 12-year-olds. One witness described the soldier tossing a three-year-old child into the air and impaling him with his bayonet. The final death toll was over 800 people. The next day on December, December 12th, the first day in the job for Elliot Abrams as Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs in the Reagan administration, Abrams snapped into action, helping to cover up the massacre. News reports of what had happened, Abrams told the Senate, were quote-unquote not credible and quote, the whole thing was being significantly misused as propaganda by anti-government guerrillas. This past Friday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo named Abrams as a special envoy for Venezuela. According to Pompeo, Abrams will have, quote, responsibility for all things related in our efforts to restore democracy. 
in the oil-rich nation. The choice of Abrams sends a clear message to Venezuela and the world. The Trump administration intends to brutalize Venezuela while producing a stream of unctuous rhetoric about America's love for democracy and human rights. Combining these two factors, the brutality and the unctuousness, is Abrams' core competency. And the piece is Elliot Abrams, Trump's pick to democra- to bring democracy to Venezuela, has spent his life crushing democracy. It's by John Schwartz in The Intercept. So look, both we should know, and of course this also can, could be quite correlated with ongoing U.S. support of right-wing forces in Central America, and this of course correlates with uh, uh, issues related to migrants and people fleeing violence and coming here and the white nationalism of the same Trump administration trying to ferment a coup in Venezuela. But it's a vital history lesson that everybody should and needs to know if you're an American. And it's present because this is the game plan in Venezuela. And that's why, again, I'm not going to make excuses or airbrush the failings of the, of the present government. But th- this is not the issue. The issue is right-wing forces and a coup and an administration tapping a point person who has gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of blood on his hands. And the position of Maduro and the position of the Mexicans and the positions of the Uruguayans and the positions of all moderate sane forces is that there does need to be some type of diplomatic process. I don't know how that works, frankly, because squeezed in the middle of Venezuelans of all classes who are really suffering because of all of these different factors is the fact that you have a Bolivarian revolution that has a, a, a real and positive history and has done some great things. It's also done some very bad things. And it's, uh, it has internal contradictions and has faced the relentless pressure of the United States. And the political representations of the opposition are U.S. manufactured far-right courses, uh, forces trying to have a coup there. So I don't know who you do diplomacy with, but I do know that you oppose... U.S. action there, period. And Ilan Omar is a hero. Now, there's some people that disagree with me about Ilan Omar. And this is pretty extraordinary because I'll give you this. At least Elliot Abrams, well, he's, as he said, that core competency of covering up slaughter and being an unctuous, you know, liar. But at least he's coming out and saying, oh, that isn't true. And, and uh, you know, and, and democracy and winning the Cold War. At least his sociopathy and lies are somewhat on the ball. But leave it to Kelly Magsimen, and I think we also, I don't know if we have the one from Max Boot as well. But Kelly Mags, Magsimen. She's a VP at, for, uh, at Center for American Progress Security. Okay, so you would assume, and I, and I just want to be really clear about this. And, and look, obviously, U.S. empire and U.S. abuse of rights is a bipartisan affair. You see this in Venezuela, only a handful of Democrats willing to speak out about coup-mongering there. That being said, some of these issues actually that specifically relate to the Abrams profile were actually opposed by Democrats at the time. You saw that Carter had put restrictions on Guatemala, which Reagan lifted, and the U.S. Congress, under Democratic votes, opposed funding the Contras, which is what led to the Iran-Contra scandal, which is the crimes that Elliot Abrams was pardoned for by uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. But the Iran-Contra affair literally leads to things like selling arms illegally to Iran to wash money back to fund these death squads because the U.S. Congress will not vote to give the Contras money and also the the, uh, cocaine smuggling that the CIA was complicit in. So... You're talking people like Chris Dodd and John Kerry opposed some of these policies in the present moment. So the base here is extraordinarily low. Okay, that, I'm, I'm giving you a huge mulligan here, which feels pretty weird for opposing genocide and the mass rape and murder of children. But I'll, you know, I understand D.C. to some extent. I'll give Kelly Maximin a mulligan. Uh, or not a mulligan, I'll give her a, a head start in a race, rather. I'll say, well, you know, I guess obviously you can't speak obvious moral truths if you're in Washington. But again, these obvious moral truths were somewhat at least reflected in the votes of like the mainstream of the Democratic Party in the 1980s. This is her tweet. 
I worked for Elliot Abrams as a civil servant. He's a fierce advocate for human rights and democracy. Yes, he made some serious professional mistakes and was held accountable. I'm a liberal, but I'm also fair. And we've got a lot of work to do together in Venezuela. I bet we share goals. Let me just, I'm sorry, and I should have warned if kids were listening, but let me just go back to some of these serious mistakes that she's not even including. I think she's probably including just his pure criminality with regards to being pardoned for Iran-Contra. An El Salvadoran, a Salvadoran military unit created and trained by the U.S. Army began slaughtering everyone they could find in the remote village of El Bozante. Before murdering the women and children, the soldiers raped them repeatedly, including some as young as 10 years old. Skipping ahead, Abram snapped into action, helping to lead, helping to lead a cover-up of the massacre. Reports were not credible, said Abrams. Okay, just a little reminder of, again, it is extraordinary to me to be in a position where I do see actually a culture that should be way less punitive and way more forgiving and recognize human mistakes and fallibility and so on and so forth. This is not normal outside of the foreign policy establishment in the United States to cover up the mass murder and rape of children and basically be like, yeah, but he was a nice guy. Now on to her next tweet. No one is not lionizing neocons, which, by the way, is an anti-Semitic term. Oh, oh, really? I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> we are agreeing on a bipartisan view of the importance of democracy and alliances against authoritarians, even as we have disagreements over other foreign policy issues. This is not hard, people. Well, actually, you know what is hard is that this alliance against authoritarians, which even... I would imagine mediocre resistance people like her. I would imagine that those authoritarians include Donald Trump, the administration for which this person who spent the eighties covering up atrocities. And again, this is a fraction of the whole world that he has laid to waste. This guy is a point person for him in a foreign intervention. And I, I, I don't even know how to, I, I don't even know. I mean, the only use of a person like her existing is to reveal the just complete, casual, profound immorality of that mindset. And speaking of profound immorality and also, you know, pulling, I mean, it is incredible. It's one thing, you know, again, this is this. I can see why people find conservatives less annoying because the conservatives are the ones who shamelessly and without any knowledge and with complete immorality come out like like Brett, you know, Kilmead, and all they know about foreign policy is getting through Red Dawn a couple of times, and they go oh, heavy work, <laughs> and they're just fucking morons, and they just bloviate, and they're just idiots, and of course they've ruined the planet. But it's the liberals and the centrists that are going to both tell you to oh, you know. Killing a kid with a bayonet is actually a lot more complicated than you think when you think about geopolitics. And incidentally, we do need to destabilize Venezuela. But they also are going to flip and get sanctimonious with you or Ilan Omar for being rude. <laughs> Which brings us to Max Boot, another person who has an atrocious public record, who's primarily a war propagandist, but because... I guess to his credit, he recognizes that Trump's just overt, grotesque misogyny and racism are inappropriate. Of course, he's embraced by a bunch of idiots who would, you know, who, who have, you know, I don't know, Hillary Clinton altars in their homes. Max Boot. Disgraceful ad hominem attacks by at Ilmar, Minnesota on my Council of Foreign Relations at CFR colleague L.A. Abrams. She doesn't seem to realize he was a leading advocate of human rights and democracy, not a promoter of genocide. More evidence of the loony left I caution Democrats about. He plugs his old column. And then he plugs his own column. Maybe this is... The same column where he said that we need to have empire for at least another three centuries. That one? <laughs> yeah, but, 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 uh, but woke empire. Um... Let me just do a little bit more uh, reading. And this is uh, Reagan, while, of course, Elliot Abrams was in charge of human rights, humanitarian affairs. This is back to Guatemala, where the genocide took place. I'm saying my, Max Boot used the phrase genocide. By the way, 
saying, and I forget who pointed this out. I, I can't, I, maybe it was discourse lover on Twitter, but it's correct. Um, that tweet is actually tantamount to Holocaust denial. Uh, there, there is a, there is a genocide in Guatemala. This is not a historically contested fact. The Reagan administration backed that government. And you can come and talk about the Cold War and infiltration and all of that shit and whatever, and you want to wank out about it, that's fine. But you don't <laughs> you're entitled to your own opinions, but not your own facts. <laughs> okay. And this is back to the Reagan administration aid for the genocide in Guatemala. The aid helped the Guatemalan military implement a key part of its counterinsurgency plan. Following the massacres, soldiers herded survivors into quote unquote model villages, detention camps really, where they, where they used food and material supplied by the U.S. Agency for International Development to establish control. And Reagan was consistent in his moral backing for Guatemala's genocide heirs. That's what I quoted before. And then uh, he, he called uh, Rios a man of great integrity and totally dedicated to, mo to democracy, continuing to quote Graydon here. Just 10 days after this meeting, one declassified U.S. document reveals that the State Department had been informed of well-founded allegations of large-scale killing of Indian men, women, and children in a remote area by the Guatemalan army. Other declassified documents reveal that the White House was less concerned with the massacre than with their effectiveness or with countering the bad publicity stemming from the bad reports from the reports of the atrocities. That of course was part of Elliot Abrams brief. Now we have a little bit more here. Uh, this is Jade Jay Nordlinger. I don't even know who he is, but he sounds aptly named. He's a national review nerd. Oh God, here we go. I am not great. This is Jade Nordlinger. I'm not greatly sympathetic. I'm not greatly sympathetic to rep Omar. Surprise, surprise. But really, someone ought to give her a clue on who Elliot Abrams is. The guy's been championing freedom and human rights his entire life and taking unholy shit from the illiberal left and right. Again, I thought the illiberal right, and especially from a completely marginalized, utterly irrelevant rag that no, has no relationship to anything, that is a fly in Trump's America, I thought the administration that Elliot Abrams is working point on now would be part of the illiberal right. But, you know, again. And then just back to, uh, uh, again, let me just say this. I'll quote a little bit more about this fervent defender of human rights and democracy, John Schwartz in The Intercept. Abrams, who previously served in a multitude of positions in Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush's administrations, often with titles declaring their focus on morality. First, he was an assistant secretary of state for international organizational affairs in 1981. And then the State Department of Human Rights position mentioned above 81 to 85. And it goes on to mention a whole bunch of other august positions. He got the job when he was 33 years old. And this is actually this is, you know, what? let's just keep doing a little Republican history here. Republic uh, Reagan wanted to name Ernest Leffen Leff. Effer, Lefeffer, as Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs, but Lefeffer's nomination ran to the ground when two of his own brothers revealed that he believed African Americans were, quote, inferior intellectually speaking. A disappointed Reagan was forced to turn to Abrams as second choice. Uh, this is who these people are, folks. Alan Omar is a hero. And That's she she gave the most classy response to the good to the minuscule amount of good faith criticisms about her tweet. And then maintained her integrity in terms of the policy set with Israel. This guy has laughed off, mocked, dismissed, and lied. I'm not gonna respond to a question that stupid. I'm not gonna respond to a question that's stupid. Said Naren. Yeah. To a guy who should be in jail, who right now, I mean, this is like some horrifying, like Clint Eastwood, Bruce Willis, like got to get the old guys out of retirement vehicle, except it's the old guys out of retirement to set up death squads in Venezuela and then lie about it. That's his brief. It's disgusting, man.